Thanks so much for coming out. I know you had like 100,000 other options um, for right now, so we're happy to see everyone here. Um, my name is Zoe Brommer. I'm an associate at the Institute for Security and Technology. I do cyber and information operations, and I'm really excited to talk to you about some research we published last fall with my esteemed panel here. I'm actually, I think, gonna wait to introduce folks until the panel portion, just so no one forgets who you are. Um, so the way this is gonna go is I'm going to quickly run through some slides, walk folks through the map that we presented, and then uh, I'll turn to the panel to talk a bit about it. So, let's see. All right, so the Institute for Security and Technology, where I work, stood up the ransomware task force in April of 2021 with the ultimate goal of outlining some recommendations to help mitigate the threat of ransomware. One of the central pillars of these recommendations um, was to disrupt the profitability of ransomware and thereby disincentivize actors from carrying out attacks of these kind. In the two years since that publication, we've been working really hard at IST and with members of the ransomware task force to operationalize these recommendations. And last year, um, we set out to identify opportunities to disrupt the ransomware business model. Uh, when we got started on that work, we were not really able to identify a comprehensive picture of the ransomware payment ecosystem. We had a general idea of what went on. You can see that here in this graphic. Um, but we really needed a lot more context in order to identify those disruptive opportunities. So we built this map. Before anyone reaches for their glasses, I'm going to zoom in on some portions of these later on, so don't worry, you don't have to squint or anything. Um, I'm just gonna quickly walk folks through um, this cycle that we've outlined here, and then um, we will get into the details. So this map was created with input from members of the ransomware task force, including, but not limited to, incident responders, cyber insurers, representatives from cryptocurrency companies, blockchain analytics firms, financial institutions, law enforcement, and many, many more types of folks. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we got everybody in the ecosystem's feedback on what they were seeing. So on the left of this map, um, you see the red triangle. That indicates a ransomware attack. Um, and while this map is really specific to ransomware, I also wanna highlight for folks that it serves as an illustration of many illicit uses of cryptocurrency because it depicts on-chaining where fiat currency is exchanged for cryptocurrency, illicit payments, obfuscation or the laundering of proceeds and the cash out process. I also just want to indicate for folks that the colors are not random. Uh, everything in green is a regulated entity and everything in yellow is either unregulated or under-resourced. Um, and those that are both indicate that actors have the option to choose between a regulated or an under-regulated avenue. All right, so zooming in on the first half of this graphic, um, this slide depicts what I like to think of as kind of the first half of the cycle. So we have the ransomware attack all the way on the left, and then we have all of the fiat currency transactions um, on chaining of fiat currency into cryptocurrency. So we start with the ransomware attack against the victim. Um, most of the time, like the vast majority of the time, ransoms are requested in cryptocurrency. So the first step for the victim is going to be to acquire the amount of cryptocurrency needed in order to pay that ransom. If the victim for some reason already has crypto, they can skip this first portion of the chart, and you can see that by the dotted V-shaped line at the bottom. But in most cases, victims don't have enough cryptocurrency to pay, and so they have to acquire it. So in most cases, a victim or an organization on behalf of the victim, like a DFIR firm, which is a digital forensics and incident response firm, will contact a depository institution and transfer money to a VASP, which is a virtual asset service provider. These entities have um, multiple ways of doing that. So as you can see in that rectangular box in the middle, they can use wire transfers, automated clearing houses, or credit cards in order to make those transactions. 
At this point, the victim will have established a cryptocurrency wallet um, with the funds in it. You can see that all the way on the right. Awesome. So once a victim has all of their crypto in a wallet, they will make a payment to the ransomware actor um, to one or multiple wallets held by that actor. At which point, the ransomware actor will move as quickly as possible to obfuscate their funds. Um, during the panel portion, I'll turn to Jackie, who's really an expert on this, um, but just for some context, cryptocurrency is pseudonymous, which means that while you don't necessarily have to give your full name and address, etc., to use a cryptocurrency wallet, your identity does exist in the fact or in that it's traceable on the blockchain. So the process of obfuscation really just means making it as hard as possible for folks to follow the chain of your identity on the blockchain. There are a number of techniques available to ransomware and other illicit actors in order to do so. They're in this really large rectangle on the left. Um, actors can use cryptocurrency exchanges where crypto is exchanged for other types of cryptocurrency and other assets. They can use peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, centralized exchanges, mixers, where illicit proceeds are mixed with other users' cryptocurrency and reassigned to different wallets on the other end, and the darknet market. So after the funds are sufficiently laundered or obfuscated, ransomware actors can choose to either hold cryptocurrency in wallets to spend later, for example, in the resourcing phase, or to cash them out um, which follows the opposite of what we did in the beginning. So off-chaining, moving cryptocurrency through a VASP into fiat currency. All right, after we designed, after we like built an understanding of how, how to follow the money from an attack through the cash out process, we began to add additional layers of analysis. So what you see here, these white tiles around the outside, indicate types of information produced at each point along the payment process. Um, we can go into more detail in the panel portion on this. I'm gonna skip through a bunch of slides which just zoom into various sections. Sorry about that. And then the blue tiles, which we've added in this layer of analysis, indicate entities with the potential to achieve technical visibility into these types of information. So what we end up with is where does the money go? How does it move through the process? what types of information are produced along the way, and who has access to those pieces of information. And the result of this, we hope, is that um, we're gonna use this as a tool to work to further identify opportunities for adding friction to the ecosystem, uh, thereby making it more difficult for ransomware actors to profit from <coughs> this crime. So I will leave my portion of the presentation here. I'm gonna just scooch on over and have a seat. All right, I would love to take a second to let my panel introduce themselves. Maybe want to just start down there, take it down, whichever way, whichever works. Hi, my name is Matt McCabe, and I'm the general counsel for Kivu Consulting. We're an all things cybersecurity company uh, specializing in ransomware uh, incident response, um, but you know we'll do the gamut. I'm Jackie Burns Coven. I lead cyber threat intelligence at a blockchain intelligence company. Um, called Synalysis, and essentially I follow threat actors and their enablers on the blockchain, and that encompasses ransomware most of the time lately. Hi, I'm Justin Herring. Um, until Friday before last, I was the head of the cybersecurity division at the New York Department of Financial Services, um, where there was the country's first cybersecurity regulations for financial companies. Um, that included working on a lot of the crypto and crypto regulation issues that are, are touched upon by, by exactly this, the ransomware payment cycle. Um, and before I came to that job in 2019, uh, I was a federal prosecutor. Um, and I did cyber crimes work, and among other things, the Sam Sam ransomware case, um, as well as lots of other kinds of hacking cases. But uh, I thought Sam Sam was the most relevant and happy to be, um, really happy to be here today. Thank you. Awesome, you all know who I am, so let's, jump into it. Um, before we really get into the nitty gritty here, I wanted to start with a question that I am asked quite often, which is um, to address an assumption that we've made 
in developing this whole exercise, um, which is that the victim in this case has decided to pay, right? The only way there's a payment cycle is if the victim decides to pay. So the obvious question here is why not just ban payments? Um, I'm going to turn it to Matt, I think, to start us off. Can you highlight some of the major arguments um, in play around payment bans? Sure. So the entire mapping exercise is certainly looking for, as Zoe said, opportunities for intervention in the criminal cycle. Um, and it seems like the most basic one would simply be the government coming out and saying, you may not pay ransomware. After all, ransomware is clearly one of the tragedy of the masses that we know that paying ransomware promotes the, the crime itself. And if you, the FBI, as they say, do not pay it, it is against national interest to pay it. But when the, country, when the company or other organization is in that situation, they have their own priorities. Now, you know, there certainly has been an evolution of, is it time to ban ransomware payments? After all, you know, there's still plenty of ransomware events that might result from mispatching, that might result from uh, inappropriate administrative uh, rights that were able to be captured, you know, basic cyber hygiene. And perhaps uh, by allowing ransomware payments, we're not providing enough incentive for the improvement of security. That's certainly an argument. I think that uh, trumping that argument has been giving the companies the ability to pay ransomware demands has actually limited the damage. That if you know, cyber criminals were attacking these companies with ransomware and there was just a refusal for payment, that you might actually be um, victimizing the victims all over again. That you've got a company that needs to return back to operations and they simply cannot. Um, so I think, and y you do have to look at the role of insurance in it. You know, sometimes. I hate to put insurance out as a hotly debated topic, but there have been accusations that the insurance industry has uh, promoted ransomware, and I would say quite the opposite. What the insurance industry has been able to do is uh, distribute the loss, the pain from ransomware, and to financially, management, man financially manage it in a way that co organizations individually could not. So I think that this, this whole structure would have come to a crisis if you didn't have that kind of financial management tool of insurance. I think that uh, we're probably not close to banning ransomware because we don't have a solution of ending ransomware. We have to make that more pragmatic. There are things that we could look at of instances where you might not be able to pay, but I wouldn't see banning. I, see, I think it is a simple but too broad solution at this point. Awesome. Thanks. Um, again, before we jump into the details, I want to turn to Justin quickly. Um, I know you just left DFS, but in your role there, you did a lot of work around regulation. So I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit about um, the role of regulation in this space. Sure. Um, I think you know there are there are several different touch points here, um, and I should add too, right? I'm, I'm obviously. Um, I am, in June, I'll be starting work uh, as a partner at the law firm of Mayor Brown. Um, for the last 13 years, I have been saying, you know, giving the disavowal line. I only speak for myself, not for my employer, but I'm actually unemployed today. So I'm literally <laughs> only speaking for myself. Um, and uh, that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> as far as the, the, um, the regulatory impact, of, uh, regulatory touch points when it comes to ransomware and ransomware payments, right? I think the one that everybody that has gotten a lot of attention, and rightfully so, is payments, extortion payments, payments to ransomware actors, right? And the, and the highlight in terms of regulation there would be the statements by um, FinCEN and OFAC, right? OFAC is the Office of Foreign Something Control, <laughs> which issues sanctions, um, about ransomware payments and sanctions rules. Right? And notably, they've made a couple of statements. I think the first one was in 2020, the second one was in 2021, which was, to many, stating the obvious, you can't pay, you can't transact with sanctioned parties, even if they're extorting you. That has always been the rule. They were just making it very clear that that applies to ransomware situations as well. They went a little bit beyond that, talking about the kinds of things they expect organizations to do as far as compliance and diligence. And they, and OFAC also, 
as a matter of law, applies to ever, all U.S. parties, right? And U.S. parties is kind of broad, doesn't just mean you're in the United States. But, um, but here they pointed out that includes the victim. It includes the, the incident response company, right? The digital forensics response company. It includes the insurance company. It includes a bank or a crypto company that's helping to facilitate the payment or, pr or come up with the money for the payment. Um, so they are making it clear that OFAC means what it says in this context, right? It applies to any transaction. So that has become one of the most important legal rules governing ransomware payments, right? Beyond that, a lot of agencies, including my former agency, have, have said that they don't recommend payments, but that's where, um, that is, that's that part of that landscape. Another part of the landscape that I think maybe we get a chance to talk about some more um, is the uh, AML rules, right? AML, which stands for anti-money laundering, BSA, which is Bank Secrecy Act, right? Some things like KYC, I'm gonna define these acronyms. Uh, know, know your customer. Um, there are a host of rules like that, right? That banks and traditional financial institutions have been dealing with for 30 or 40 years. In a nutshell, they are designed to prevent criminals from using the financial system um, to transact in furtherance of their crimes or to get the money out from their crimes, right? In a nutshell, banks have to monitor transactions for sanctions. They have to monitor transactions for criminal activity. Um, in the ransomware, the, what drives the ransomware payments economy, right? And it is an economy, there's a whole industry behind this. Um, lots of different kinds of businesses that specialize in different aspects of this criminal ecosystem um, is crypto, right? And as, um, as Zoe just showed us, right, that often that crypto in the payment cycle often does touch on regulated entities. And those companies have the same obligations to try to monitor for, block, prevent, report transactions that could be in furtherance of a crime. So I think that's important, maybe not as appreciated and discussed as much as the rules around paying extortion, paying ransoms. Um, and one of the things that I think has been really exciting about this project is I think if you look at the payment cycle that um, the task force put together, it really helps to understand. Gosh, it's not just payments, payments to bad guys, extortion payments. There's a lot of places, just like you know, more traditional crimes, like narcotics trafficking, for instance. A lot of places where the whole criminal ecosystem, the whole criminal industry could potentially touch on a legitimate regulated company. And those are all opportunities to add friction. Awesome, thanks. All right, um, nobody get motion sick, but one second. Okay, there we go. All right, let's turn um, to discuss the first phase of the map a bit. And Justin, you made a really uh, a nice transition for us to talk about some other opportunities that aren't just in the actual moment of payment um, that may arise. Jackie, I'm gonna turn to you first. I'm hoping that you can tell us a little bit about the role of service providers, especially in providing attacker infrastructure that helps um, these actors facilitate these attacks. Yeah, um, thanks, Zoe. And uh, you know, one of the great things about IST's ransomware task force is that you get to converse with people along the entire chain from flash to bang. And, um, being able to put those pieces together to create this payment map, which I think has been so valuable in creating dialogue and identifying points of friction. Um, and what we can do with, the, one of the benefits of cryptocurrency is its transparency. And so we can actually track that payment, that ransom payment made to that threat actor. And it doesn't just go to the, straight to the bank. They have a lot of expenses they've racked up. We know ransomware is not monolithic. There's multiple people involved. There's multiple tools and services. A lot of these services take payment in crypto. And some of these services have legitimate use cases. You and me and many in this room have bought emails, have bought servers with crypto. And that's totally um, for totally legitimate activity. But these threat actors may also use the same infrastructure and they don't necessarily have robust KYC re requirements like an exchange would necessarily. Um, and, and one of the reason, and just going back to the earlier question on you know, why, why not outright ban ransom payments, and I, 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 I wanna key in on a really important factor is that you know, penalizing or re-victimizing victims would diminish reporting, essentially. And it, having the ability to track ransom payments to quantify success um, and 
quantify impact of policy decisions is really critical um, from the strategic standpoint. And then to your question, Zoe, on tactically, being able to trace the payments to a service that might lead to attribution or interception, seizure, uh, being able to trace it to those infrastructure providers. We can really hone in on the centers of gravity of these attacks. So we, we see reuse of the same bulletproof hosting providers, VPS, VPN services, um, which can also open up a lot of policy options, right? And opportunities for disruption. So um, that's another, I, I think, uh, seat at the table of these like, really vibrant conversations we've had at the ransomware task force is being able to bring all these stakeholders together and talk about opportunities for identifying these payments. Um, and, and so, yeah, inf the infrastructure piece is, is very critical uh, to these. So I, I don't want to diminish the, the cash out aspect, um, but by looking at what's in their shopping cart, we can actually see attack preparation too, right? We can see staging, we can see the purchase of C2 domains um, through the cryptocurrency payments, which is a really powerful thing. Awesome, thanks. Jackie, you brought up reporting, and I think it's really important that we spend a moment talking about the importance of reporting. Um, Matt, maybe I'll turn to you in your role as an incident response firm. I'm hoping you can talk a bit about some of the due diligence um, that you and your firm use. Yeah, and I do want to make a clarification. I don't think that being an incident response firm puts you in the role of, um, of being a regulated entity for reporting ransomware. I, I think that what Treasury's designation was getting at that if you're an incident response firm like, like ours that includes in its services your facilitation of a ransomware payment, then you could be acting as a money transmitter and then you should consider um, registering as a money service business like our company has. There are other incident response companies that have just said, we don't do that. We don't do that high risk part of it and I think that they've probably stayed on the other fence of the regulation. Um, it is a very strange thing. I mean, obviously, uh, we talked about the AML rules, any money laundering rules a little bit, and, and those become uh, more intense as you go through the chain of exactly how is this transaction generated? Is it likely to lead to criminal conduct or money laundering down the line? I mean, for us, it is, for me, it is comical if somebody who reports to the Treasury every transaction that we have because we know darn well it's not suspicious, it's criminal. And we're basically saying this is another one and it's going to lead to money laundering, so keep an eye on it. Um, so reporting on our end is just kind of, you know, find another financial institution that reports 100% of its transactions as suspicious. Um, now there are growing ransomware requirements for notification. And I think that that's going to be helpful, but it's also going to be a question of managing data. There's so many requirements coming in as far as ransomware notification, what that's going to include, what the timelines are going to be, whether you can get useful information to the regulator within that specific timeline, or is the presumption that you're simply going to supplement as you go along. Um, there's a lot of questions about notification. I think that the real questions about management of the data and analysis of the data. I mean, Jackie from Chainalysis knows very well about aggregating data and coming up with useful insights for intervention as a result. And you can start picking out who are the most problematic actors and, and who you can concentrate on. Sometimes it turns out, you know, the greatest greatest warriors against uh, botnets and other infrastructure of malicious cyber activity are Microsoft lawyers who can go into court and simply challenge a domain registration as inappropriately using a Microsoft name and, and, and taking down a botnet in that fashion. Um, so that's kind of a, a meandering response to, to <coughs> ransomware notification. It is, it is helpful, um, it is essential. Uh, I, I think that industry and government still can do more with the volume of information that's coming out. Awesome, thank you. All right. I'm going to skip through some of this just 
because I want to make sure um, we have time for audience questions as well. Um, but let's turn to talk about obfuscation because um, I think it's a really important piece of this. Jackie, I'm hoping you can speak a little bit about this. Um, maybe if you would for the audience, give a little bit of background, a little bit more detail about the purpose and process of obfuscation to start us out. Yeah, so um, I, I think these threat actors are wisening up to the fact that the blockchain is not anonymous, uh, their transaction, it's actually pseudonymous, and so we are seeing enhanced obfuscation techniques than we've seen in years prior. I think there's been a number of law enforcement successes against ransomware actors that have helped catalyze this realization, um, which is, is wonderful, but again, it's a cat and mouse game. They're gonna continue <coughs> to improve their tactics and they have to keep up. So one of those tactics is more cosmetic, um, is the rebranding of these strains, right? So as researchers um, and government entities identify different strains as related to a designated entity or from a designated jurisdiction, we will see these strains change their name or, or maybe tweak the code slightly. Um, but we can actually see in many cases on chain, on the blockchain, these threat actors reusing the same wallets or same financial fingerprint. Um, if anyone had to go through the Silicon Valley bank fiasco, I'm sorry, but you understand how hard it is to change a bank account. It's really hard for threat actors to change up their laundering strategy. Um, a lot of time these might be expert hackers but aren't necessarily expert launderers. So um, we have a lot of times uh, victim representatives and incident response firms that are using blockchain analytics to understand the financial signature of a strain they're going to pay to ensure it doesn't overlap with a designated entity from our library. So that is one uh, piece of, of obfuscation. And, and going back to um, you know, reporting, and um, I, I, I have to give credit to the policymakers that have been careful of outright designating strains. I think my view is that it's likely to give victims the option of paying if they need to. And so much to the chagrin of people who are in the decision of is this designated or not, they have to make that, that distinction. And when they're in that gray area of d determining and doing their own due diligence on whether it's related to a designated entity. And then um, more tactically, the obfuscation we're seeing is the use of mixing services and uh, tumblers. And we're seeing this with greater frequency. Um, I think um, maybe it was dark side that kind of uh, really pioneered, especially with the competitive ransomware as a service landscape, all of these ransomware trying to outdo each other, trying to compete for talent. We saw dark side actually advertising that they had a built-in mixing capability as, as a way to, to bring in um, new affiliates. We saw that Darkseid actually got their funds seized from Colonial, right? So it's not exactly foolproof. Um, so what I'm saying, but there's a number of mixers out there. Um, but luckily, we are seeing a really active um, a, a law enforcement and, and policymakers that are going after each of these off ramps. So we see going after darknet markets like Hydra, which also had a built-in mixing capability. Uh, chip mixer, um, and then other high-risk exchanges that that um, threat actors would use to launder. So this is this is kind. Of, we're, we do see that um, that law enforcement is paying attention to this kill chain and this this payment cycle, and and picking off different critical nodes of it. Um, so making it more, I guess creating friction in the payment cycle. So it's exactly what this task force was set up to do. Awesome, thanks Jackie. Yeah, Jackie, you brought up the role of sanctions um, and I thought it might be good to hear from Justin a little bit about the role of sanctions and other government action in this space. Yeah, I think, you know, I had started to talk about some of that earlier. I think for um, the role of sanctions as a practical matter um, and I actually, the SAMSAM ransomware actors were the, the first ransomware actors to be subject to sanctions. Um, and that was a case that I investigated and prosecuted. And since then, there have been several others. Um, I think is to, is to effectively 
the mechanism to, it doesn't necessarily stop the criminals in their tracks the way, say, an arrest would, um, but it does force them in many ways to operate um, underground, disband, the individual criminals might reform later or sometimes try to reform under a different brand. But it can very much complicate their operations. We've seen that, um, saw that in different contexts, including the fact that even other criminal services sometimes don't want to deal <laughs> with fellow criminals who have been sanctioned. Um, it is a very powerful, it can be a very powerful tool because it, being cut off from the financial, from all touch points in the financial system um, can be a huge hardship, even for criminal organizations. Um, as, you, as you've seen all the different ways in which they, it is helpful for them to be able to access um, the regular financial system. So I think that is, that's an important tool, even if you know, it doesn't necessarily result in the criminals retiring and hanging up their, um, you know, hanging up their hats, so to speak. Um, I think on the other end of that, um, I talked a little bit earlier about AML and transactional rules, right? Another piece of this, um, as I said earlier, like I think one of the great things about this project and the reason I've been so excited about it is I think it really crystallizes for everybody from InfoSec people to lawyers and policymakers and regulators, kind of what this ecosystem looks like and how many touch points there can be on the more traditional or at least more traditional crypto financial system. Um, I think on that end of it, right, one of the things at DFS about a year ago, we are, at this point, the country's leading licensor of crypto financial companies. Um, we've extended licenses to about 30 companies. The atmosphere towards crypto companies has been so chilly in Washington that New York, my, my old department, is, is almost the de facto regulator of crypto in the United States because we're like the, the only regulator <laughs> who's handing out licenses to crypto companies and trying to set up a regulatory regime for crypto companies. About a year ago, there was a guidance put out, which is basically a statement by the regulator, a statement and a set of instructions about how to screen for criminal transactions in crypto if you're a licensed, regulated, you know, lawful crypto company, involving the use of blockchain analytics tools um, to monitor transactions so you understand who's on the different ends of the transaction you're processing, whether either of them are associated with criminal or suspicious activity. That's an example, and using it to facilitate know your customer, right? If you have um, a customer that wants to open an account, execute transactions, you might ask them to provide you with information about who they are, but trying to validate that as they're transacting through chain, um, blockchain analytics tools can be um, really important, right? And I think a lot of that is very much, that kind of regulatory public policy direction, a lot of that is driven towards making sure that the, at least the legal part of the crypto economy is as resilient against being exploited by criminals as the traditional banks and financial companies, right? And, I, and just candidly, right, since, um, since I'm speaking for myself today, the crypto industry is not where the traditional banks are. In some fairness, banks have been dealing with these kinds of rules and criminals for decades, right? The crypto industry is a younger, less mature industry in some respects, including in their abilities in transaction monitoring. But encouraging that to grow, I think, is a, is a really powerful way to undercut the criminal economy that are behind things like, like ransomware. Um, yeah. I, if Ooh. I could just kind of tack on to that, though, there was, you know, to Justin's point, there's a fascinating memo that came out of Treasury um, just earlier this month, and it kind of shone a new light on what the opinion of regulation of crypto is. And you know, if you were to kind of uh, synopsize it in a, a very, um, all, my parents are both from Queens, so I'm just going to use it in a very easy way. So saying like, hey, you might think that you're not regulated and you might call yourself decentralized financial institution, your fancy DeFi term, but first of all, we make that analysis. We make it on a fact-based uh, decision and you know what? You probably are regulated already. We really don't need to pass a whole bunch of new regulations for you. The likelihood is that you fall within these regulations already. And despite the fact you've been calling yourself DeFi, ain't no D in your FI. So um, I, I think that there's going to be an awakening of regulatory actions against some of the companies that have thought that they're not regulated. Um, you know, and it, it kind of is that really familiar treasury way of, even if you go back to the OFAC statement about you know, whether DFIR companies are part of 
um, OFAC sanctioned regulations and have to be on the lookout for it. Well, you know, they're, they're, they might have been coming out and just saying very helpfully, oh, by the way, if you're thinking of doing this, you should realize that you're still subject to OFAC sanction. But there are those who, who including myself, who assume that as a regulator, they probably saw a couple things and said, what the heck is this? Like you get your one, your one mulligan, but uh, ain't no more gonna happen. So from now on, realize that if you come close to skirting a, a sanctioned uh, payment, then you can expect us to come forth with an enforcement action. And you know, I think that Treasury, with their memo early this month, has fired that warning shot, and we can expect a, a clampdown on some of the industry participants that maybe have called themselves unregulated in the past. Can I jump in? Please, uh, I, mean? I want like a bumper sticker. Ain't no D in your five. Ain't and no I, D I in your five. I appreciate that. Clean if we have an statement. intellectual property lawyer. <laughs> 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 if, I, if I was a, if I was still a regulator, I would steal that for the the header of our next guidance on that. So good, so good. Um, no, but I, I will say that even those those twin ransomware advisories that you had mentioned earlier from Treasury, I think, were helpful in educating the financial ecosystem on what their regulatory obligations were for reporting ransomware. Um, and it was nothing new, it was no new requirements, it was just reiterating what the responsibility was. And I think we're really seeing now, in 2023, the, the, the result of educating the entire ecosystem on what ransomware is, uh, what to do when you have it on your platform, whether you're paying or whether you're on the receiving end of that ransom payment. Um, and I think, I'm mean, getting on my reporting soapbox again. Um, and another good reason to report, and, and we saw with the high ransomware takedown earlier this year, those that had gone proactively to FBI, so in many cases, were able to get decryptors without paying. Um, and just to kind of the TLDR of 2022's ransomware story is that there was a 40% decline in ransom payments, which is massive, or, and especially after coming off of a year 2021, which saw record numbers of nearly a billion in payments. So a 40% decline. And we can't credit just um, one takedown or one piece of the ecosystem. It's really like all the, all the members that are representative of the task force. It's really law enforcement takedowns. It's designations on the cash out points causing that friction. It's the availability of decryptors, not just from law enforcement, but from private researchers and private companies. Um, and, and not to mention that some of these ransomware actors actually kind of hung up their hat you know, for the, you, the conflict in Ukraine. We actually had a report from Google recently that outlined Cuba ransomware as moving from uh, for-profit ransomware activity to potentially espionage. Um, and other destructive activities. So, um, no, and it really takes every part of that, that payment cycle and all of those participants that Zoe outlined to make that happen in 2022. Yeah, and I, I can tell you for our company, we have a rule that we will not facilitate a payment unless it's been reported in advance to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Awesome, well, Jack, you said it better than I ever could. So I think we're, maybe ready for some audience questions. Before I turn to questions though, I just wanted to highlight two things. First is that this map along with um, a report that explains everything much more eloquently than I have here today um, is on the IST website. We are also almost finished with a mini pilot. Oh man, Rick's already in line to ask a question. <laughs> We're already, okay, yeah, so we, we have this mini pilot that's almost complete. I worked really closely with Jackie and some others on it. Um, where we've mapped uh, ransomware threat actor TTPs, which are tactic techniques and procedures, uh, atop this map to kind of um, apply some real world examples to the theoretical map we've put together. So keep your eyes open for that. That's coming um, soon. I won't put myself in a box there, soon. Uh, all right, Rick, hit me with it. <laughs> I'm a plant, by the way. I am a <laughs> member of the task force. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, 
what other areas you're focused on in creating friction beyond the payment? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, others are welcome to jump in here too. We, so this map was really um, an illustrative example of kind of what our options are. I think with the map complete, um, in my mind, there are two main paths forward uh, in terms of next steps. So the first is gonna be to identify information sharing opportunities between entities in blue. We can go back a little, yeah. So between all those blue entities, like what information are they seeing at each point in the chain that they could be sharing um, to folks further on in order to try and identify and interdict those payments? And the other major opportunity um, at this point, we're always welcome for more ideas too, um, is gonna be regulatory and other government action. So those are the two um, main next steps that we have coming. I think there, there are more detailed hints in the mini pilot that we, that we are almost done with. So thanks, Rick, for your question. Hi, I'm Gary Warner from Dark Tower and from UAB. Um, back in 2021, the House Energy uh, and Commerce had a hearing that uh, your chair from IST, uh, Philip Reiner, was at. Uh, my congressman asked him the question, why didn't the task force put out a recommendation that you shouldn't make the payment? Mm -hmm. And Reiner's answer was that that was the only point that the task force hadn't found agreement on. Um, and he said that the basic fact was that the infrastructure is not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anybody knows what that means, that the infrastructure isn't ready yet, and what could we do to be able to be in a position where we could say there are no payments? Awesome, thank you for your question. Um, maybe I'll turn it to, I mean, any volunteers. Can I take a shot? <laughs> I take a shot? Sure, yeah. All right, um, so uh, I realize there is one thing on which I do not agree with my esteemed co-panelists. Um, and uh, since I have the luxury of speaking only for myself, I will say that as a public policy matter, I think we would be better off if Congress passed a law that prohibited uh, ransomware payments. Having been, having been deeply immersed in this area for a long time uh, in law enforcement and as a regulator, um, I, one of the things about being in law enforcement is you spend time studying the criminals. You even get to spend a lot of time talking to them. Um, usually after, after being arrested, they you know, see the light and want to do less time um, and cooperate. Um, at times, I even talked to criminals that weren't arrested. Um, we'd fly to countries that wouldn't extradite just to chat. Um, and I can say, this is not surprising to anyone, they don't do it for the love, they do it for the money. Um, and I do think it is quite clearly the case that if it were illegal to make ransomware payments, ransomware as we currently know it would stop. It's not to say the cybercrime would stop. There was cybercrime before ransomware was a big thing. There's plenty of crime happening right now that has nothing to do with ransomware, but it would stop because I don't think there are enough organizations that would violate, are willing to violate federal law and make a payment to keep it make, keep it going as a viable criminal business. Mm -hmm. So that's my personal view. Now, I wanna add a, some important caveats, right? Lawyers like to say sometimes that the greater does not include the lesser. Even though I think that is correct, for instance, I did not take the view when I was an insurance regulator up until 10 days ago, that insurance <laughs> companies should be barred from covering ransom payments, right? Um, I did not, do not think necessarily that um, hodgepodge crackdowns on ransom, or you know, helter-skelter, or, or non-uniform, non-universal crackdowns by regulators just on companies just for paying are particularly productive. I didn't take that view when I, I was the regulator. Um, and I can see, I understand why organizations, from government agencies to um, companies are often in the position, the unfortunate position of concluding that that is their best option. Um, you know, and so I, I kind of, in a sense, I don't support like, I guess, lesser or partial bans because they don't have the, the happy outcome of stopping ransomware um, that I think a federal ban would have. And I should say, again, personal view, I don't know of any government agencies that taken that view. I think it would take an act of Congress. I don't think it's likely to happen in the foreseeable future. Um, and in the absence of that, you know, it, it's clearly, it is, it's unfortunate to have to make an extortion payment like that because you are paying criminals and part of what they'll use it for is to finance keep building the infrastructure for future attacks, right? It's really a classic prisoner's dilemma that we're in, um, that the victims of ransomware attacks are in. Um, if we all stopped paying, we would win, but 
you don't really control, only Congress can do that, right? Individual companies and agencies can't do it. So that's, that's my, my personal take on payment. So I, I would say reclaiming my time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that there is an issue of, I mean, believe it or not, the, the first rule of a regulator or a legislator is do no harm. And there's a fear of what's gonna happen. So if you see that there's a 40% reduction in ransomware and you assume that you're on the right track, Going out and banning, you have to wonder, what are you gonna break? And what if there is the critical infrastructure company that, that's okay, do you wanna get that? That's fine. <laughs> um, that if you have a critical infrastructure company that all of a sudden you know, is not able to distribute gas within the Southeast United States, well, is there the mechanism for a license to pay this one because this one's pretty important as opposed to company X is going to, you know, screw you, you didn't patch, so this is your fault. I mean, look, ransomware as can continue to succeed as long as three things keep happening. Companies stay vulnerable, the ransomware attacker stays safe harbored behind some foreign jurisdiction who will not assist with our prosecution, and cryptocurrency continues to enable them to get money out anonymously. Now, if you own a company, say you own a manufacturing company in the Midwest, you've been you, this victim of a ransomware attack and the government turns around and says, you can't pay to restore it because you're hurting other people. My question is, why didn't you do more to stop these ransom, these thieves that are on the street? If it was an assault, you'd send out police. What are you doing for me now? So I just think it's, it's not cut and dry. Yeah, and I will say one, one key factor I neglected to mention when I was talking about the decline in ransom payments last year, insurance policies was a, was a major factor in that. Companies were better defended. They had plans for when ransomware did happen. And in some cases, it negated the need to pay. Um, with respect to this um, debate, which I love, it's if only someone was researching what happened, what, what, uh, what bans actually do to the ransomware ecosystem. Alan Liska, do you know anyone who's researching what the <laughs> impact of bans is? So that was not gonna be my question, but yes. Uh, <laughs> Counter, kind of counterpoint to your point, in 1991, after a spate of kidnappings throughout the 70s and 80s in Italy, they banned um, uh, paying kidnappers, so they banned ransom payments. The next two years, kidnappings actually went up because the kidnappers, uh, th no, they didn't just ban ransom payments, they actually, if you were a family and you had a loved one kidnapped, they froze all your assets so that you absolutely couldn't pay except of course if you were really, really rich, you had assets other places. But kidnappings actually went up because the kidnappers knew that not only could they get the ransom payment once they sent an ear over, um, they could also then extort you for the fact that you paid the ransom to not report. And even when we look in the US, North Carolina banned ransom payments last year for public entities. The number of attacks against public entities in North Carolina went up. Not that the ransomware actors necessarily expected to get paid, they just didn't care. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying, I get it. There is an important empirical question, right? And different people can have different views on it. And again, I should know I'm not only talking about a federal ban, I'm familiar with the North Carolina thing. I don't think that helps so much because the ransomware actors would have to know a lot to know that only public institutions in North Carolina were banned. But the question is whether or not if you banned it, would it actually stop? Would, would cause ransomware actors to switch to other crimes, or would they keep, or would they keep rolling? Right? That, there's an important empirical question there. And if I'm wrong on that, then I'm wrong on the policy. <laughs> All right, so can I, I ask my question real quick, Zoe, or do we got to go? I don't make the rules. I'm so sorry. Okay. I think we have to oh. be done. But I will be. I'll be hanging around. So come ask me your question. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.